I'm Kevin Davis, and this is the Catholic Fan Podcast, and we have a very special guest and a special episode for reaching 1,000 subscribers. It's a big day. It's been a big week. It's been a fantastic few months for us here at Catholic Family Podcast. We really have tried to put out good content, especially for the Lenten series, which has been contributed by people all around the world. Father Borja especially has put in a lot of work for that. And that's our goal is try to provide good content, have on good guests to talk about good topics, Catholic topics, cultural topics, and to try to spread God's good word and try to bring people to the faith and to the truth. And today we have on one for the world premiere, I should say, for the world premiere, we're seeing his face for the very first time. Nova Soto Watch, also known as Mario Dirksen, had, is joining us here. I, I can't, could not be happier to have you on, Mario, and to, to discuss a little bit about yourself, Nova Soto Watch, and, well, the Nova Soto and exactly what's going on in the Catholic world or the Nova Soto world today. So thanks so much for joining. And, and I guess maybe we could start with a brief introduction of, of who are you? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me on, Kevin. It is a great pleasure, a great honor. As you said, my name is Mario Dirksen. I am the editor of Novo Sordo Watch, also the founder. And uh, I am also the voice of Tradcast. And um, essentially, I am just a Roman Catholic layman. And uh, I live here in the United States of America in the great state of Ohio. Great. <laughs> questionable but okay move on <laughs> <laughs> the buckeye state <laughs> the buckeye state yes and, and so when when did you start nova sort of watch I, I think that many of the listeners or viewers you know have know about it i mean it, it's it's been in the the lingo for for many years when did it start and, and i guess we'll start with a when and then maybe tell me the why afterwards Absolutely. So I began Novos Ordo Watch in the year 2002. So we're actually coming up on a 20 year anniversary. I don't recall the exact day that it uh, actually went live, but I do know, uh, because I can look it up, that the domain NovosOrdoWatch.org was registered on September 3rd of 2002. So I kind of like to make that the founding day, which also providentially was the Feast of St. Pius the 10th. Perfect. Nice. So yeah. it's been uh, 20 or, well, just over 19 years now. And, um, you know, the year 2002 was uh, a difficult year. This is when all the abuse scandals broke. I believe it was in January of that year. And, um, you know, I came across really horrific news day after day. And at the time, I was not yet a set of a contest. So I'm basically looking at all this and I'm saying, this is horrible Catholic news. And um, I wanted to have a way to catalog all that. And I said, you know, this is, this is horrific. Really, somebody needs to uh, essentially create a list uh, of all these, uh, all these things that are coming out and not just regarding the uh, abuse scandal, but also very much um, just just terrible things, not just, um, but also especially liturgical abuse, right? I mean, there was just goofy and crazy things going on at the new mass all the time. You had a lot of wayward priests, Novus Ordo priests, like, you know, promoting abortion, for example. I mean, just stuff that was in no way justifiable. And I saw that day after day. And at the time, I was already traditionalist. I was actually more or less affiliated with the Society of St. Pius X. That's where I went to Mass. And so I considered myself essentially an SSPX Catholic. And um, so I was definitely a traditionalist already. And I just wanted to have a kind of repository for all of these horrible things to collect the evidence against this new church. That was the original idea behind it. And, uh, you know, I got the idea for uh, the name Novos Ordo Watch because it was like, you know, what, what I was wanting to do. It was uh, a watching of this Novos Ordo Church, of all these things that are wrong in the Catholic Church or what I at the time believed was the Catholic Church. And uh, so, you know, with that, I wanted to set up a dedicated website just for that. And I think 
can't remember exactly now, but I think the main thought behind it was um, with, it, it was supposed to have a definite focus on liturgical issues. Like I said, there's a whole lot of other stuff as well, but I thought it would have a heavy emphasis on the new mass and everything that is wrong with it. And of course, you know, 19 years later, there's still some of that, but at the same time, there is so much stuff going on and there is so much that, um, I mean, there's only so many posts on the new mass you can take, you know, at this point, we've pretty much seen it all. Right. right. And, and at, the, at the time when you started, did you already work or, or not necessarily professionally, but were you already a journalist or did you did you have any training that, that gave you kind of this idea that you could do this? Or were you just kind of a guy who said, hey, let me give this a shot? No. And let me clarify, I would not consider myself a journalist or anything. I would just consider myself a researcher, writer, blogger, commenter commentator, podcaster. Um, and so I had a background in philosophy, educational background in philosophy. And that helps a lot. It helps a lot in, uh, you know, it helps a lot with logic and, and knowing how to think and analyze arguments and, and so on. But, you know, most of the stuff that I was coming across, it was just so evident that this is bad. Uh, right, especially I think the first link, the first story I ever put up on Novo Sordo Watch was about a Novo Sordo priest promoting abortion. Wow. And so, you know, you don't need a PhD in philosophy or theology to know that that's, I mean, there, there's just no way to excuse that. And so that is uh, how it all started. And of course it expanded, went through a lot of, just like anything that, that grows, you, you know, it starts small and then uh, circumstances often will point the way in which to go. And so, you know, originally Novo Sorda Watch was basically going to be a collection of links to news stories. And uh, that was the with a little bit maybe of commentary underneath, right? I, I would uh, put those little reality checks uh, initially in the in the early years. It was a news story, for example, you know, at the time it was John Paul II claiming to be Pope. And, you know, you had um, stories like whatever John Paul II says, uh, you know, I don't know, everybody will be saved or something crazy. Uh, and then you just provide a little reality check, check from sacred scripture or from the Council of Trent or, you know, some kind of authoritative Catholic source. And that's what I did in the beginning. And then eventually what happened is that as technology advanced, I needed to upgrade the website and I made it into more of a blog. Whereas before it was just, a regular web page with links and that same page would continually be updated. But then we needed to move to a, a blog format because uh, it was, there was, I don't know if you're familiar with RSS, mm -hmm. RSS feeds, but this is a technology that allows people to subscribe to your content by means of subscribing to the RSS feed. And every time you publish something, every time you come out with something new, it will automatically send a notification to that subscriber. And uh, that seemed like a good idea. So I had to, uh, it, was, it was only possible to, to connect that to a blog. So, you know, then the question was, what do we do with those uh, blog posts do we just want to put one link for each blog post? Do we want to create a whole new blog post just to put a link up? It didn't make, it just, it just didn't really fit. And so I decided instead to provide a lot more, more commentary, uh, to write more stuff, more articles and so on about, about these things rather than just supplying a link. At the same time, there was so much, uh, news that needed to be covered. I didn't want to get rid of the, the practice of putting up links, right? News stories with, with just links and maybe a little bit of commentary. And so I retained that in what is now called the News Digest. 
So that's uh, basically the, the leftover from the original idea. Or you, you might think of it this way, that originally all of Novos Ordo Watch was a perpetual news digest. Got it. And and so around what time was this? Was this, this after a few years that you changed to more of a blog? Or, or how long did you run it as a news digest? The blog... So the blog, uh, that conversion took place in September of 2016. It's so about uh -huh. five and a half years. Mm -hmm. Before then, it was um, in that other format I described with mostly news stories with links, but a little bit of commentary. Even, so, so if, it, even if it was just a quip, like a remark or something, just like you see in the News Digest now. But that was actually until 2016, so for, uh, for quite a while. Interesting. And then I should mention that in the years of 2006 through 2012, I uh, temporarily handed off uh, Novel Sort of Watch to an associate of mine, simply because I needed to focus on other things in my life. And at the time, I actually thought that um, Novel Sort of Watch was pretty much done for me, that, you know, somebody else was now leading it. And I would simply continue to contribute occasional articles. And this is where my original article writing began, if I remember correctly. And uh, that was, so that was from 2006 through 2012. And then things just became so, there, there was a lot going on. You know, those were the Benedict years for the most part. And, uh, you know, the Society of St. Pius X seemed to be on the verge of a reconciliation with Rome. So, um, and, you know, continually there was this, you could tell that all the important traditionalist issues were being commandeered by, you know, the group of people that I now call the semi-traditionalists, the semi trads the recognize and resist traditionalists you know, that you find basically Lefebvreists, right? But not only, not only Society of St. Pius X, but also a lot of the indult people. You had publications like the Fatima, the uh, Fatima Crusader. You had publications like um, the Remnant and Catholic Family News, the Angelus. And it, it seemed like we were not having a whole lot of influence you know, in, in in that discourse over all these issues. And at that point, I decided, you know what, I think it's it's time for me to step up and make an effort um, to uh, really make the set of our communist voice heard. There was just no reason for why we should be signed like, you know, all the semi trans they have all these 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 outlets, these publications, and we have very little. So I decided to get back into it. And then four years later, approximately, was the upgrade, you know, to the new website. And, uh, you know, since then, uh, you know, we've just been at it uh, full blast. And, and, and uh, so are, are you the, the primary contributor then to, to Nova Sort of Watch? I know you do all the Tradcast episodes but you're, you're the primary contributor to the to the website yes it, yes it, novel sort of watch the, the content is almost all me um i do have uh, an additional writer uh that contributes occasionally and for whom i'm very grateful because he provides a lot of substantial uh and important um you know argumentation and analysis and commentary and those posts are um, they are uh, marked as coming from Francis Del Sarto. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then I have a little bit of help uh, here and there as needed uh, from just volunteers that assist with researching, uh, very much with translating, and uh, also with graphics as needed. And I definitely don't want to forget to mention my audio and video guy who makes uh, awesome video clips. And so if, if you see an impressive video clip on Novus Ordo Watch, you can bet your bottom dollar that he uh, had his hand in it. And so right. I appreciate him very much. And uh, he also optimizes the the audio and he puts together the video for the Tradcasts. 
And so, so, so I guess in the early days, your your meat and potatoes was covering the the news or the the scandals, I suppose, of of Rome. Um, what would you say now is the meat and potatoes of the Nova Sorto watch? I think you you do kind of branch off into different things, but what what is your primary content? Would you say? Well, I would say it's it's probably Francis. Okay, because the guy just cranks out so much stuff. He always keeps you busy. And, you know, even if there's a little bit of a lull or, the, you know, he goes on retreat or whatever, there's always something from him, whether it's an interview that gets published at that point or if it's, um, uh, for example, then he contributes a, a foreword to a book or something or he writes his own book, uh, which I just heard about another one and there's that guy is he has a way of always staying in the news and so i think um most of you know what i publish is at the end of the day is about francis just by sheer necessity and you know that guy is really good at causing a mess for sure and uh he talks so much and he talks I mean, his theology is so bad that it's very easy to find something wrong with what he says. And uh, you don't have to go look for it. it. It usually just jumps out at you. Well, and I know you, you told me before the show that you'll you'll have projects planned and you got them all lined up and you want to do this, this and this. And then, boom, you know, you read something that, that somebody did or Francis said something that now you got to report on. And I think that's that's, that's going to be a pretty tough tough way of how you how, how you operate right because yeah, so every day exactly every day is like unique because you never know what comes up you never know what's going to happen and so there's plenty of stuff there's plenty of unfinished posts that you know i'm working on and um so if if all news were to like uh completely stop today i would have enough content to publish for the rest of the year Okay, easy. If if I uh, you know wanted to do it that way, unfortunately, the news does not stop today, and um, you know, and of course, it's not only Francis. He, you know, it's his cardinals, it's his bishops, it's his presbyters, uh, whatever. You know, no, the, so there's the things they they put up in churches here in Germany and in Aust Austria, especially. I mean, it's, it's really incredible. I mean, things that you unfortunately have to report on, and we're going to talk about later. We're going to talk about russia and the consecration and, and all these supposed consecration yes. all these different topics but before we do I, I really have there's one thing that i've I've always wondered because i i i don't read all of the material that there you pub publish a lot but obviously i've read quite a lot and so many of your articles have so much content i mean that they're, they're they're just huge they're they're they're, they're gigantic you know usually I'm, I'm accustomed to going to a website if it's if it's a news so, you know, whatever I'm looking for, usually it's pretty short. You can read it in two to five minutes. Mm -hmm. I'd say yours are typically not, that's not the case. You, you just have so much content that's really there to really fight a battle rather than just have a snippet. And so my yes. question, I've, I've really wondered, and, and you can answer that, sorry, real quick. But the other question is, where do you find the, where do you find this stuff? I mean, how do you do your research and where do you find these, the proper quotes and the proper sources to be able to answer in, in such a, an extremely long and impressive way, I guess. So what I've noticed, um, unfortunately, is that oftentimes it will take me a lot longer than originally anticipated to complete something. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that as you, you know, think things through, there's just more and more stuff that comes to your mind. And, you know, whereas originally, you, you you know you thought oh cool you know francis said something really stupid here that 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 shouldn't take me longer than an hour to write something about and then you start going through it and you're thinking hmm well i guess if i'm going to say this then i'll have to prove that i don't want to just make assertions i want to back them up right and then you research that and then you realize oh well maybe that isn't as simple as i thought for example and so, um, you know, one thing leads to another, or then you find something else that Francis maybe said that should also be uh, talked about, or you remember that Francis said something similar, and it would probably be a good idea to give people the links to where they can read more about that. 
and uh, yeah, before you know it, you've you've written five pages, and you know, so it's actually a little bit frustrating for me because I'd like to to get more done, but I don't want to provide a blog that just throws a few things at people and uh, doesn't do it right. I want people to have to to find a novel sort. I want a good resource, a reliable, dependable resource that gives them not only information as though it were coming from me you know who am i i'm not important you know it what what i say has no value unless i can back it up from from church teaching so uh that's why i put a lot of emphasis on and i put a lot of efforts into providing people with uh, the resources or you know with the the um you know, quotations and documentation, especially from the magisterium. And um, yeah, you asked me about what resources I use. I can share a few with you if you like. That'd be great. I, for, One of I, the, I don't know if everyone's interested in that, but but for me, it's just like, again, I mean, where do you find all of this? I mean, it just seems like you'd have to be digging through a library somewhere for hours to be able to find it. Well, so, you know, some of it is by the grace of God, um, you know, that I will... Uh, sometimes just remember a certain phrase that relate, like, for example, in, oh, I remember, you know, reading in St. Pius X, he said such and such. And if the phrase comes to my mind, I can quickly do a search and I'll see, you know, where that was. And then I can read the context. Same with scripture quotes. Um, but oftentimes, you know, <laughs> that's not how it works. And so I simply have to look stuff up. And I think this is actually a great, um, just a great rule of thumb, and it should always be for us, just look it up, right? Uh, that is ultimately how traditional Catholicism should work, right? If you if you want to be a traditional Catholic, then you, you look up the traditional Catholic teaching on these things. And thankfully, there are some wonderful resources. Now, many of them are out of print, but you can get them used, and some of them are actually scanned in, and you can find them maybe at archive.org or Google Books or wherever. And, you know, maybe we can put the uh, links to where people can find copies of what I'm about to uh, uh, show you here. The first uh, book I want to mention, which is an absolutely terrific resource. I'm going to make sure I'm going to try to hold this up into the camera here. It is the whoops, Dictionary of Papal Pronouncements. Can you see that? Yep. The Dictionary of Papal Pronouncements, Leo XIII to Pius XII. So it's the years 1878 to 1957 is when that was published. And it's collected or edited by uh, Sister Claudia Carlin. And what it does is it gives you, this is actually in alphabetical order, but it doesn't, it really doesn't matter. All of these papal pronouncements, encyclicals, uh, apostolic letters, uh, speeches, addresses, whatever, it gives you the, first of all, the title and um, a brief description, uh, the word count, and the, uh, of course, the Pope and the, uh, the day it was given. And then, uh, let's see, I'm trying to do this here in the camera. It actually gives you a summary of the content of that encyclical or address or uh, whatever it may be. And so in the end, uh, I should say at the end of the, of the book, then you have a whole bunch of references to uh, source documents uh, where you can find, you know, the English translations of these documents. And it also has a simple alphabetical index. So you can look it up by topic. Okay, so for example, if you want to look up communism, what do the popes say? Again, Leo the Thirteenth through Pius the Twelfth. What do they say about communism? Um, you know, you can just look it up, and it'll point you to the right documents. So it's an invaluable resource. And so this was published in 1958. Wow. Yep. So it's uh, again the Dictionary of Papal Pronouncements, absolutely essential. Uh, then, of course, uh, we have, everybody needs this, right? Denzinger, the sources of Catholic dogma, or the Latin term, it's also known by the Incaridian Symbolorum. And that is the collection, it, this is actually, 
I guess, a semi-official uh, uh, collection because, you know, this is the kind of uh, source that theologians would use to um, to reference, uh, you know, magisterial pronouncements. And so this consider this is the edition from they, they, they've uh, updated it, of course, since then with Vatican II and all, you know, all that modernist junk, but. This is uh, the tr the translate uh, translated by Roy de Ferrari from the 30th edition of Denzinger's Enchiridion Symbolorum. Henry Denzinger was a priest, I believe, in the 19th century, and he started this collection. And it really begins with apostolic times, right, with a creed. And this edition goes, I believe, through let's see, about about 1950 or so. And uh, it has basically the most important excerpts from excerpts from all sorts of papal documents, councils, and so forth. And it is also, of course, there's an index, an alphabetical index, and um, you can buy you can buy this. It looks different now. It's uh, it's green now from uh, Loretto Publications. They still publish this, and uh, this is the 1950. Four edition. The English translation was published in 1957. Um, but you can also find the contents of this online for free. Okay, the electronic, uh, the, the contents have been made available electronically. So, which is really nice because then you can just do a search on a particular keyword. So that is also an invaluable tool. And so are, then, these, are these books, real quickly, are these books something mm -hmm. that you think that a normal Catholic should have? Or do you think if, if it's for somebody who's a little more advanced and a little more, I don't know how to say it, a little more ready to to defend the faith, you know, and to, to study apologetics or, or whatnot? Yeah, I, so this, I mean, this is important if you're interested in locating the original magisterial sources. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, you could just use a catechism, but if you're interested in what was actually published by the magisterium, by the popes, right, or the sacred congregation of the Holy Office, uh, then this this is just uh, really important. And again, the content is available uh, electronically for free, so you can just look through it and see, is this something I want to buy? Mm -hmm. um, then another absolutely essential tool is now this is actually a collection. The collection is called Papal Teachings. And this particular one is on the church. This collection, I can't remember now how many volumes it has. It's got quite a few, like seven or eight maybe. This was put together by, by the Benedictine monks of Solem in uh, France. And it begins with each, I believe it is, uh, each volume begins with Pope Benedict the Fourteenth in the year 1740. And it ends, well, you can't fault them for that, but it ends with John the 23rd, which is actually quite good because it means it has everything from Pius XII's reign in it as well. You can just ignore John uh, the 23rd. But it will, so it provides excerpts from all their documents, addresses, speeches, uh, encyclicals, apostolic constitutions, you know, bulls, whatever it may be, it is all in there, uh, again, excerpts, not the full text necessarily, in English, and you can look, so this, I should say first, this is by topic, okay, so this one here is on, on ecclesiology, right, so the church, the pope, the bishops, the magisterium. And it is very easy to find stuff in it because of the indices in the back. So it begins with it has a regular alphabetical index, of course, so you can just look something up, you know, by keyword. But what's much better than that and much more powerful is the analytical index, which 
kind of breaks down ecclesiology into its component parts. And so, you know, for example, there's one part on the mission of the church, then one on the constitution of the church, and so on. And everything that is found in there, all the teachings about the church are, you know, um, broken down into their elements. So, for example, here you can see, you can look up, the church is the body of Christ. And so then it, it will tell you, let me see, right here, for example, and, you know, readers may not be able to see this, but um, it will tell you where to look, um, you know, where the magisterial teaching is that says that the church is the body of Christ. And then it breaks it down into the elements like Christ is her founder, Christ is her head, Christ is her savior, Christ is her support, right? And so it does that for every issue that is related to Catholic ecclesiology, and it is absolutely an absolutely phenomenal resource. And again, here you can see, you know, it references all these, these numbers, uh, which you can then find here in the body of the book. And those in turn are cross-referenced to other magisterial documents that talk about the same or, or similar subjects. So it is a very, very powerful tool. Papal teachings, the church. It, there's also uh, volumes on uh, holy matrimony. That's another uh, volume in the, in the papal teaching series. Then there is one on the lay apostolate. There is one on uh, the human body. There is one on Our Lady, Mariology, also very, very good. There's one on the Sacred Liturgy. So tremendous resources. And again, all, all the texts in there are in English. Then let me also definitely recommend this right here, the Sacre Theo Theologiae Summa. That is not the Summa of St. Thomas Aquinas. It's not what we're talking about. This is, it basically means a summary of sacred theology. It is, in English, it is an eight-volume uh, dogmatic theology collection. Uh, the original Latin is four volumes, but in English, they made it into eight. They just uh, split each one in half. And so this contains... It's just absolutely phenomenal. This contains all of the church's dogmatic theology explained, defined, and it shows for each teaching, it shows what the status of that teaching is, whether it's dogma, whether it's doctrine, whether it's a theological conclusion, and so on. And then it goes into where the church teaches that. Again, it shows you the magisterial sources. And it also shows you the proof from reason as applicable. Like it, it explains how, given the sources of revelation, how we arrive at that particular conclusion. And then there, there's some controverted subjects where the, the theologians you know, will give their opinion and justify their view if it's disputed. And then it will also show who the adversaries of this teaching are, okay? So it will it will mention uh, who the heretics are that dispute this particular dogma, right? Or that if it's not dogma, that uh, dispute that particular doctrine. Then it will list objections that people might make against the teaching and answer those objections. So it's fantastic, and it was this was translated fairly recently only by Father Kenneth Baker, okay, who is actually a Jesuit uh, who is retired. I believe he's still alive, and he has done the world a phenomenal service by translating all these volumes. Uh, so the one I have right here is the one on the Church of Christ and on Holy Scripture. It's, uh, as you can see here, it's volume, volume 1B. So for each volume, uh, 1 through 4, they've got A and B. And... Um, the other volumes are, I have to take a quick look here. So, for example, they're on the sacraments, they're on grace, they're on the introduction to theology. They are um, basically, you know, eschatology, all the different you know, sacraments, dogmatic theology topics. And 
Uh, thankfully, this is in print. Okay, it's published by Keep the Faith. I believe it came out in 2015. And, you know, if you're interested in studying sacred theology seriously, I would say start with that collection. You know, if you can only afford I think they're like $35 or so is the, the retail price per volume. So it's, it's a pretty hefty price, but it's a very sturdy book. And the content is absolutely phenomenal. So I would say if you're, you know, if you can afford only one book or if you, if you want to, uh, you know, if you're interested only in one single book, make it this one, start with volume 1A, of course, but uh, that is uh, probably the, the, the best one uh, out of all the ones I've, I've mentioned here as far as giving you, the, you know, the most bang for the buck. Like, because, you know, this is just very systematic. And originally, so like I said, this is the English translation. This whole collection was published in the mid-1950s. Okay, so just before Vatican II. And, um, you know, late enough to where it contains almost, like, it, it contains the information from uh, the, the, the magisterial content uh, from almost... Uh, to the end of uh, Pius XII's pontificate. So it is uh, extremely valuable. And the last book I want to mention is uh, regarding scripture commentary. Uh, it's one thing to read Holy Scripture. It's another thing to know how to understand it, right? And perhaps the best... Now, this, of course, has not all been published uh, or has not even been translated into English yet, but there are a number of volumes available. This is... The Great Commentary of Father Cornelius Alapide. And he trans, uh, rather, uh, he compiled a scripture commentary. Now, this is not his own opinion or whatever. Uh, he actually presents the commentary and the explanations of the scriptural text of the church fathers, the doctors of the church, basically the church's best, most authoritative uh, theologians. Right, so very weighty authorities on how to what scripture means, and he goes verse by verse, literally. It is a treasure trove of information if you want to know uh, how to understand sacred scripture. And so this right here, for example, this book is the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark and St. Luke. He was able to fit uh, two into just one volume here because... Saint most or a lot of Saint Mark uh, overlaps with Saint Matthew, so he provides all the commentary in Saint Matthew. Uh, for Saint Matthew's Gospel, actually, th those are published in two volumes because they weren't able to fit it all in just under two covers. And so, um, that is absolutely fantastic. That's published by Loretto Publications, and uh, they, to my knowledge, they're still they're still publishing uh, more volumes. So. Cornelius Alapide, he commented on every single book of the Bible except the Psalms and Job. I don't know why he didn't comment on those. My guess is that he simply died before he was able to finish. But out of those, uh, not a whole lot have been translated into English. All of the New Test, actually, no, that's not even true because the Apocalypse has, I don't think has, but maybe it's currently in the works. I don't know, but there was, you can find an English translation of uh, whatever was released many years ago on archive.org, the great commentary of Cornelius Alapide. Um, but Loretto Publications has actually, uh, the, the translation that was made decades ago I'm not sure exactly when, maybe about 100, 120 years ago or so. Um, that was, it, it's not as smooth as as this translation is. This is a really good one. Yes, I know it, it was, you know, uh, revised and and expanded by a, a Novo Sordo bishop, I believe it is. Um, but, you know, here we're only talking about translating what Cornelius Alapide wrote. And he was a... Um, I believe a Flemish Jesuit, a Dutch uh, or, or Belgian Jesuit in the, I want to say the 16th or 17th century. And so it's very reliable. And, I, and I've seen some um, 
yeah, I've been able to compare a little bit uh, the older translation with the newer translation, and this is definitely, in my opinion, a lot better than the older translation. So this is published by Loretto, and um, you can get, they have published their revised translations for all of the, the, the four Gospels, as well as a good number of the Pauline letters, as well as the letters of St. John. So... Um, that is, uh, that's all I have for you right now. Those are some of the really, really important tools I use. And um, like I said, they're extremely valuable and I can only encourage everyone to look into those. No, that's fantastic. And I, I think that, again, I'm, I'm not the only one who's wondered that. So I, I'm sure there are people who've appreciated that. Ah, so that's where he gets all this stuff from. And what really strikes me as you go through <clears throat> talking about these books and the papal teachings. And if you read, if you go and read an encyclical, which I'm sure you've read many, I mean, and you really get this sense of, of having a, having a father, you know, having, having a spiritual guide, right? I mean, that, that's of course what they are there for to help us to help guide us as our spiritual fathers. And that's something that obviously, I guess it's the segue into the, the one who should be the spiritual father, you know, of, of the Catholics and is very much leading people into confusion and, and into disarray, I suppose. And, and I think that, I guess, I don't know where you start with this because I mean, I, I guess you, you really started, you, you amped things up, I think around the beginning of, of Bergoglio's reign. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Or, or uh, around that time, was that something that 2012? So just before, yeah. Okay. And so, so of course, what, little was it something that, that changed when he came in? You're kind of like, okay, this is something I, I really have to, you know, amp it up because of him, or was that just a coincidence? No, that, that all just remember. So, so Francis came on the scene in 2013, right? I, I got back into it in 2012. And um, so little did I know there was going to be a conclave, you know, a year later, but you could just tell from the very beginning that guy loves to talk and he loves to hear himself talk. I think that's pretty clear to everyone. And, you know, I am so grateful that at least, you know, ever since COVID, he at least cut out the daily homilies at the Casa Santa Marta. I mean, every day it was just him, you know, uh, saying more stuff. And I mean, he already talks a lot as it is, but it's like that, that daily sermon was always an, an extra thing you had to, to go through, you know, and uh, especially in the beginning, you know, he started throwing all these insults, you know, at people. And it, it was just so anyway, from the very beginning, it, it was evident that this guy was going to be a lot of work. And, and was that, yeah, I mean, I guess. <laughs> Do you I, remember? It, it, oh, been, yeah, hey, it's I, been absolutely. Nine years now. It's crazy, right? It's crazy how that's fun. It's crazy what's what's all happened in that in the meantime. I mean, I mean, I, I could you count on your hand on on your fingers, you know, the the heresies or the the absolute, you know, in, incredible statements that he's had, or, or Pachamama, or now, obviously, again, we'll we'll talk about the the consecration of of Russia and and mm -hmm. and how there's there's rumors now that perhaps you know the consecration is to Pachamama, not to Our Lady. I mean, <laughs> but but the crazy thing is. I, I, what's incredible is that those rumors that often if it was any other even false pope you'd probably be like yeah come on you know that's come on don't don't say that stuff yeah. but with him right it's kind of like yeah could be could with be Bergoglio, anything is possible remember right. that when uh the whole pachamama incident happened and then they had all these figurines in the roman churches right and alexander chiguel god bless him took them and threw them in, into the tiber um, Francis apologized not for the sacrilege, not for the idolatry, not for any of those things. He apologized to the indigenous that these statues, and he called them Pachamama statues, that they had been destroyed or, you know, stolen, disposed of, whatever you want to call it. That was his apology. He's very good at apologizing for the wrong thing. And not apologizing for what actually needs an apology. So yeah, that, that was whole thing, utterly stunning. Yeah, that whole thing was was really shocking. That you really got to see everyone's true colors in many ways. That, that you see, there are some good people like like Alexander Chugwell, you know, who do truly want you know good and want you know faith and are of goodwill. And then you see 
you see the people when I, I'll never forget they had the Pachamamas in, in the Vatican Gardens, I think. And they had, I remember seeing the pictures of them. And I, and I remember seeing people from the SSPX and others, you know, commenting and saying, no, no, come on. This isn't some goddess. That, that, they're just they're representing Mary or or, or St. Yeah. Elizabeth or something. And it's like, OK, yeah, well, I guess we don't know for sure. And then what the next day, Bergoglio was like, nope, nope, it's Pachamama. Right. Oh, yeah. No, it, it's it was so. It was so scandalous what took place there. I could not believe what I was seeing. I think it was October 4th, 2019. It was the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi. And in the Vatican Gardens. And when you look at that ceremony that took place under Francis' nose, granted, he didn't himself participate in the, you know, circular, you know, the prostrations and all that stuff. But... Um, if you look at the ceremony and 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 I you know for anyone who has not seen it please look it up on the internet I mean Vatican News you know uh published it um if you don't think that is at a rate I mean it was like how you would have imagined the golden calf ceremonies to look they were all you know dancing in a circle and you know prostrating themselves on the ground before these two idols and uh, then there was another ritual with them digging uh, a hole or whatever, or filling soil into a hole. It was just something else, you know, related to Gaia worship, Pachamama, Gaia, Mother Earth, whatever you want to call it. And I should probably point out also that this uh, Novus Ordo Cardinal, uh, uh, what's his first name, John, John Francesco, whatever, Ravasi, who's Francis. Uh, front man for uh, culture, Pontifical culture, uh, Council f of Culture or whatever, he himself participated participated in a Pachamama ceremony, and we have the video. It's on Novus Ordo Watch, and I think it was in 2015 or so. The video didn't come out until a few months after it happened. And you can see him walking in a circle around this... Uh, Pachamama spread where they're offering their their you know food and drink uh, or, or whatever it is uh, to this earth goddess, and so the 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 most evil thing though that happened, and I think a lot of people may not even be aware of this because it wasn't so visible, is that you got to remember all this uh, this um, Vatican um, the ceremony in the Vatican Gardens took place on the eve of the Amazon Synod, and in that context, right? I think those were Amazonians, people from the Amazon, mostly, that were conducting the ceremony. And they, so they were present, I, I guess, for the whole Synod, which was about the Amazon, right? And just three weeks of bishops talking about, you know, enculturation and, and you know, supposedly evangelization. And for the closing of that uh, synod, the closing liturgy, you know, you know, mass, right? They had uh, a procession, uh, of course, and part of that procession was um, one of the Amazonian women carried a bowl through St. Peter's to the high altar. It was received by Francis, and in that bowl was an offering to Pachamama. I mean, this is documented, right? It is, it, it, it was a, a some kind of a plant, right? It looked like if you if you really if you really don't know what's going on, you might just think, oh look, they're you know they're giving him flowers to put on the altar. Well you got to look a little more closely. It's actually no flower. Um, and then if you look at if you research what sort of adoration ceremony, what sort of sacrifice these pagans offer to Pachamama, you find out that is what they do. They uh, they put uh, uh, dirt into a bowl, and then they put all sorts of things into it. And I don't have the, the details in front of me now, but and we can certainly supply the link on that. And that was even reported by inside the Vatican, okay? Uh, not exactly a state of Acantus source. So this has nothing to do with, uh, like, it, this is not coming from state of Acantus only, right? So inside the Vatican is a conservative Novus Ordo traditional leaning uh, magazine, 
uh, and it's both online as well as uh, you know in print. And it is uh, the editor is a highly respected, uh, accredited Novus Ordo journalist named Robert Moynihan. So this is not some crazy, you know, wacko, uh, silly blog or something. This is this is pretty uh, hardcore novel sort of journalism. And so, and, how, how can you? How can you? I just don't understand how you can be someone like that or someone like like Taylor Marshall, who totally supports Chuguel and and backs him up. Whatever says says how good it is to throw these Pachamamas into the river. Because why? Why is that good? You know, if you if you say that was a good act, you have to admit that they were bad, right? Why were they bad? Because they're idols. Why are idols bad in the bad? So I mean, it's really logical. And so if that's the case. You have to admit eventually that that Bergoglio was at least part of it. He was at least allowing that. And how can you possibly so, come to yes. the conclusion that he can be the Pope? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, to me, I mean, I, I just it seems that's the first commandment to to literally you know to to not worship other gods. And you're saying that this man who claims to be the Pope is literally doing that in St. Peter's without anyone even denying it, and he can still remain the Pope. So, and, and when Bergoglio received that offering, he placed it on the high altar of St. Peter's. Now, if that is not the abomination of desolation, uh, I don't know what would be. That is a pagan offering to the Mother Earth goddess. And um, it, it's placed on arguably the holiest, uh, you know, altar in all of Christendom. Okay, St. Peter's Basilica. And nobody bats an eye, you know. But and we wonder, we wonder why the world is going going to heck, right? I mean, it's like, well, what what, what do we expect? You know, when the the man supposedly supposed to be the pope is doing something like that, and and, and you make such a good point about the Gaia, you know, the, the worship of Mother Earth. Tell me if I'm wrong that it seems like Bergoglio that that's his goal, right? It, the, the, he doesn't want a Catholic Church. He wants us to oh, that's worship. For sure. He wants us to he worship. He does the not earth want. And, Right. What we can say for sure is he does not want the reign of Christ the King. Absolutely not. That is the furthest thing from his mind. He does not want all humanity united under Christ the King and giving him worship and homage. And, you know, not, of course, I want to, I want to clarify that. This is not about, like, forcing people to, to become Catholics or anything like that. Understood. But it, your goal must be that all people convert to our blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his holy Catholic Church, right? And so be saved, right? And, and uh, attain to eternal beatitude in heaven after their life on this earth. That is what we desire for each and every human being, right? And so that is not what this guy wants. That is absolutely not what Bergoglio wants. He wants a world of peace and fraternity, and, it, you know, uh, interreligious dialogue and all these things, th that is his ideal. That is not just a means to an end. That is not just, um, you know, a, an intermediate step to, okay, well, first we have to, like, talk to each other, and then we'll convert everyone. No, that is what he wants. That is the ideal. It is not the Catholic confessional state. It is not the kingship of Christ. Uh, for all humanity. Um, that is not what he wants. And yet that is what the Catholic Church was founded for, right? And Pope Pius XI uh, outlines this in great detail in uh, his encyclical Quas Primas uh, that was issued less than 100 years ago. It was 1925. And, you know, the beautiful thing about reading these old encyclicals is quite simply uh, that you notice when you immerse yourself in them, this is a different religion from this Vatican II religion. The, the tone is completely different. The content is different. The emphasis is different. You will notice that in all of the teachings of the true popes before Vatican II, there is always the, 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 uh, the emphasis at the end of the day is always on the supernatural not on the natural, because our end, the goal for which we were created, is supernatural. We were created for an eternity of beatitude in heaven with God forever. That is the goal, that is the reason for the existence of every single human being that has ever 
been created and will ever be created. There is no other goal. And if you miss that goal, you've missed it all. See, that right. is the, that is a very scary reality. And if you keep that in mind, you ask yourself, what are these Vatican II, uh, these false popes, what are they doing? Joseph Ratzinger is on record telling a Lutheran who was working as a translator in the Vatican, telling her not to convert to Catholicism because she was thinking about it. You know, maybe we can put the link to that in the in the uh, show description as well, in the video description. Well, one of the greatest enemies of the church, right, of all time, that no one even denies. And I saw that too here here in Karlsruhe, Germany, which is the, the city from where my wife is from, uh, unfortunately mm -hmm. for her. Mm -hmm. One of their main churches, and we walked in just to see it. It's a Nova Soto church, and it's it's just more of it out of curiosity, and it's as it's as ugly as you would expect. And <laughs> what really stuck with me was this huge bust, this huge statue of a red statue for whatever reason of Martin Luther, huge. And, and I could be wrong, but I'm fairly sure what it said underneath on a little plaque was "One of Us." Oh, my I'm not goodness. positive, but I'm fair. I'd have to ask my wife again, but I'm pretty sure in German. That's what it said, which, which again, that they're just, they're fully saying, as you said, it, it's, it's all good. We're, we're, we're also Lutherans. They're also Catholics, which is obviously absolutely insane. I mean, it's, it, you can't even, I, I can't it's not even, you can't even make this stuff up. It's so crazy. No, precisely. Right. That's uh, one of my slogans. You can't make the stuff up. No, you can't. And, um, yeah, France's goal, if you read Fratelli Tutti, and I did read it, in full, it was my three days of darkness, for sure. <laughs> it was absolutely awful. Um, but th that that is the guy's goal is to get all religion. Like he wants to have a world in which the ideal is there to be many different religions. Because remember, that's what he said is what is willed by God, right? The diversity and pluralism of religions is willed by God. And I know a lot of people say, oh, he meant it in a negative uh, sense, like it's God's uh, negative will, like God's uh, passive will, like God simply tolerates it for the sake of a greater good, you know, for the sake of the conversion of, of the elect or whatever. But that is not true. Even though Francis himself later on claimed that as an audience, at an audience, he claimed that that was, uh, you know, after, you know, I guess enough people had, uh, you know, uh, pointed it out that, uh, excuse me, that's like apostasy, <laughs> you know, um, he claimed that, oh yeah, no, 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 no. I meant this in a, in a permissive will uh, sense, right? The problem with that is that um, that's not possible. The sentence does not make sense if you uh, understand it that way, because he put it in the, I don't, I don't have the exact uh, um, phraseology in front of me now, but he put it in a list, like he mentioned that God wills a diversity uh, and pluralism of religions uh, just as he, no, excuse me, um, I should probably look it up just so I don't get it wrong. In any case, he said that just as God wills there to be different sexes, different races, different languages, so he also wills there to be different religions. Now, either, either he meant, uh, either God wills all of these passively like in terms of toleration, or he wills all of them actively in terms of it, that actually being his, you know, desire. But you can't say, well, the religion is the one he meant passively and all the other items, sex, race, religion, color, whatever, oh, excuse me, not religion, uh, sex, race, color, uh, and so on, that that is meant, um, you know, in, in, the, in the positive sense of God positively willing that. You can't do it. You can't have it both ways. Right, so it is an utter impossibility, which to you know to trans to to uh, try to put an orthodox meaning onto that sentence, which means that when Francis signed that, that was part of the document on human fraternity that he signed together with a Muslim imam in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. That was in February of 2019. I believe it was February 4th. When he said that, he signed uh, not just something that is wrong, not just something that is uh, heresy. This is actually blasphemy and it is apostasy. 
if think about this for a second if god willed many different religions then catholicism is over then jesus christ is a liar right like there is no way you can reconcile that with catholicism so i was shocked when i saw that i was shocked not that he would believe that but that he would say it and say it so blatantly and so um that right there makes him if, if nothing else that alone makes him a public apostate um th there is nothing left of catholicism or really of any religion that claims to be the true religion it does away that statement does away with the idea that god has revealed a religion it doesn't even matter which one it's more fundamental than that it denies it basically says that it, it basically says that no religion is true right uh or that god can contradict himself whatever i mean it, it just either way you slice it it is apostasy it is blasphemy well and, and it seems to me it seems very freemasonic and it's, it seems to me very like he so. clearly wants to be the the religious arm of globalism which means very as, as so. you say if that's the case then he has to make sure you know it's all good we're just going to kind of base it all off of fraternity and charity i guess i mean i mean so, it's ecology you know right? <laughs> right that's all he wants is he wants one world of everybody getting along everybody gets to have his religion of choice just not the catholic religion the real catholic religion because it doesn't tolerate this idea of that everybody believe whatever he wants again we're not saying coercion like you can't coerce people into the faith that would not be right that would not be faith um but it can't be your goal to have many different religions and you know this stuff is so fundamental um anybody who's taken a look at the new testament can see that how, how wrong that is christ didn't come to earth to teach us to appreciate each other's religions whatever they may be and just be nice to each other that is not the gospel right i mean christ was very uh, clear he was clear to the jews uh specifically you know to whom he was sent directly and then of course by extension also to the gentiles uh you know if you do not believe that i am he you will die in your sins you know christ came to earth to reveal to, to complete god's revelation and uh, because he is the only savior right and that is why we must par be part of his mystical body that is why we must believe his doctrine you know and you can see like bergoglio is big on saying that christianity is not a system of doctrines or whatever he said that's exactly what it is now of course you have to do more than just believe that's clear like this is interesting you know because the lutherans are the ones that say faith alone right that's a heresy but then francis loves the lutherans there, there's so many occasions on which he has endorsed lutheranism specifically he's he's even like this whole this is all vatican ii right this idea that they all share the same faith you know, all the baptized, no matter if you're Lutheran, you know, Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic, it doesn't matter. They all share the same faith. They actually believe that. Now they'll they'll you know put a caveat in it and or whatever and, and say, well, we, but it's not the fullness of faith. But that's not how it works. The Catholic faith does not admit of um um how should i say it doesn't like you can't you can't have just parts of the catholic faith it's true that you can affirm certain truths that the catholic faith also includes right you can believe you know for example a protestant might believe in the bodily resurrection of christ but not in the assumption of the blessed virgin but that doesn't mean that he has uh, you know uh, uh the catholic faith in part he doesn't have it at all Right, and Vatican II has actually destroyed that uh, that very notion, and so now they have the faith in parts, like elements, and all that. And you can see what it does in the end. It, it's a complete and total mess. I mean, they've been they've been talking, uh, they've been having ecumenical relations pretty much since the close of Vatican II, right? Maybe, uh, well, roughly since Vatican II. 
and and look at where it's gotten them. At this point, they can't even agree on the goal of ecumenism. They can't even they don't they don't even have a consensus on why they're talking. It, it's it's utterly insane. Uh, you know the the conservative uh, novel sort of apologists. I don't know if they still do or not because it's getting increasingly difficult to do that. But um, at least for a long time, and I and I'm sure some still do. We're insisting that well, ecumenism. It really the goal of ecumenism really is the conversion of non-Catholics to Catholicism. No, it's not. That's actually that's actually the one thing they all the different ecumenical parties agree on that that is not the goal. It's 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 quite ironic and. Um, you know, if you want to talk to some of these uh, Protestant uh, parties, you know, that are part of the ecumenical, all the, this whole ecumenical circus, ask them if they think that the goal here is conversion to Catholicism, to make them see the light of Catholicism. Oh, no, they would tell you, most likely, that if that were the goal, they would want no part uh, in ecumenism. So well, and and it's so good you bring up Vatican too because I think that that's a lot of what these these as you say these these semi trad apologists they they I think they put a lot of hope in the idea of okay Francis is just a really bad time it's a really bad couple of years we're gonna power through it you know some of them go to the you know think that okay Benedict is still the true Pope and this is all just a charade you know charade it's it's all fake but I think that's ultimately the 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 core issue and again I, of course you agree with me as a city of a contest that. It all goes back to Vatican II. All of this stems from that. I mean, Francis has just pumped it up to, you know, tiny, he makes it crazier and crazier. But these issues all stem from there. As you say, ecumenism, you know, this the idea of indifferentism, collegiality, I mean, all, modernism, these, these things that were signed back in the 1960s, yes. that's what we're seeing. You know, the fruits are, are really extreme, I suppose, now and in rotten. And you see so many people leaving the Catholic Church, the modern Catholic Church. And, and, and I guess that that's... That's so important to realize for people to realize that it doesn't start with Francis or Bergoglio or JP2. It started back at Correct. Vatican II. He is simply the most mature rotten fruit, as I think uh, is, is one way to put it. And, you know, um, I mean, Vatican II is, I guess, ambiguous enough to, you know, you can read it this way, you can read it that way. And and if they ever really want to contra contradict Vatican II, like where it's not liberal enough or whatever, well, then they'll just say they developed the teaching. They just developed it, right? Um, I mean, look at what they've done with the death penalty, for example. Uh, there's no way you can reconcile. What, Francis is now saying the death penalty is inadmissible because, oh, human dignity and how, whatever they consciousness has developed on human dignity. Well, the first thing to point out is that uh, obviously it's not the dignity of the victim of the crime, but only the perpetrator, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, you can't go from uh, what the council, well, I should say the catechism of the Council of Trent, the old Roman catechism, You can't, uh, what that says is that uh, the death penalty, capital punishment, the execution of criminals by the lawful state authority, that that is an act of paramount obedience to the fifth commandment, which prohibits murder, Okay paramount obedience they've gone from paramount obedience to a contradiction of the like a violation of the commandment now you can call that whatever you will but it is not a development of doctrine that is a corruption of doctrine it means the opposite of what it used to mean and so um you know development is legitimate you can uh, certain uh, i mean a catholic teaching uh, can develop but it, it can only become more precise. It can be clarified. Um, you know, it can never mean the opposite of what it used to mean. Because if that were possible, then what is a corruption? Right? And so, no, and, and so what was the latest thing Francis just did? Uh, oh, yeah, on uh, just war, right? So he's repudiating the Catholic teaching on just war. And, you know, you always have uh, these Francis apologists, and that they'll make all these arguments about, well, he meant this and he meant that. And if you, you've you got to read it, you know, together with that document over here and then that speech over there. And then also take into consideration what the catechism says, because you can't assume he's meaning to contradict that. You know what? If Francis, why is it that Francis always means all these orthodox things, but never says them? 
right? I mean, you would never accept that from anyone else. It's not like the guy is incapable of expressing himself, you know? So if you want to say that, oh, Francis is only saying that um, in our day, none of the wars being fought actually meet the criteria for just war, which is entirely possible. Why didn't he just say that? Why didn't he say that? Why did he say no war is just or war is always unjust? You know, uh, and then, by the way, the reason he gives for saying that uh, that war is always unjust is because, well, because the people of God suffer. Okay, well, by that criterion, then, then you know, the church's just war doctrine is wrong. Yeah, and so here again, you have contradiction. It's not development. Well, and it seems like, I mean, since Vatican II, and, and Francis is the king of this, is, is ambiguity is the key word, right? I, you, you always want to give them something, some some little bit of truth, you know, some little pieces that, are, that sound good. You know, talk about charity, talk about treating your neighbors with respect, all these different things. And then you know they just slip in little errors, or or as you say, they, they, he says something that can be taken multiple ways, or, yes. or sometimes he just says, I mean, I mean, like the 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 divorcees being able to receive communion, and that that's something again that, that's just like, okay, no, I don't think you can just do that, right? But but again, somehow he still has his apologists because they're they're just so stuck on the fact that he has to be the pope. Yes, it's so bizarre how people would rather have a pope that whom they then refuse submission to than have no pope to submit to it it is it, it is utterly mind blowing and then you find out and again then this goes back to um you know these resources here um if you you just have to read just look it up read the traditional catholic teaching on the papacy and you will quickly realize there is no way francis is the pope absolutely impossible if he is the pope then catholic teaching on the papacy is false but that's heresy okay to say francis is not the pope is not heresy even if you think it's wrong Okay, so um, so people who, you know, there's a lot of people who think that, well, let's just say Francis is the Pope, we just won't, we just won't submit to him, like we will just re reject his, his false teachings. Uh, they have misunderstood how, like how this works. Um, there is nothing safe about that approach. Like they'll, they'll, they think that they'll be on the safe side. They'll just say he is the Pope because just in case he is. Well, you know, saying that somebody possesses the supreme pontificate, so that somebody is the vicar of Christ, that has meaning. You can't, it's not just a label, right? As uh, Michael Madden and Christopher Ferrara were saying at some point, uh, that, uh, you know, they were treating it as just a label, like, you know, what, whatever we want to call him, Pope, anti-Pope, anti, -pope, anti you, know, what, you know, they, like, they, they were trying, I guess, to uh, find a more conciliatory approach to where we basically say, hey, um, it doesn't matter what he is, we just can't go along with him. But again, then you have never read the Catholic teaching on the papacy, if that's how you approach it. Because, um, well, what I should add is that that makes it all the more bizarre. If you think, essentially, that him being Pope has no real meaning, like you're saying it doesn't matter if you call him Pope or anti-Pope or whatever you want to call him, well, then why are you so insistent, on the other hand, that that uh, people recognize him as Pope? I, I mean, you're not submitting to him anyway. You might as well give him up. It would be more consistent. It would be more honest. And I understand that, you know, people then say, well, but then where is the next pope going to come from? Like, how is that, how is this going to resolve itself? Legitimate question. But if someone can be, if someone like Francis can be pope, I'm not sure we need a succession of popes. You know what I mean? You've made the papacy meaningless. What is the purpose of the, of the perpetual succession of popes? If not the teaching of the Roman Catholic faith and the governing of the church 
you know, unto sanctification and ultimately the, the uh, eternal salvation of souls. If, if that is not the goal, um, or if, if that is not guaranteed, then we don't, then it, you might as well n never be able to recover a pope because then none of it matters. So the objection is, I, I can I can sympathize with the objection that city of our countries have no clear, easy answer on how this is going to get resolved. But, uh, you know, I mean, we didn't make the facts. We didn't um, create the situation. We don't want the situation. We want to have a pope. Absolutely. Um, we simply find ourselves faced with, with this situation and we're uh, trying to understand it in light of Catholic teaching. And that is the only conclusion we can come to um, how it's going to be resolved. There are theories on that. Uh, most notably, the material formal theory that uh, some some set of Arcantists adhere to. Um, and we don't need to get into that now. It's rather complicated. But essentially, that that is one way uh, that you could have a pope. Uh, again, let me just say very briefly, and to those who are not familiar with it, it may sound completely off the wall crazy, but I'll just say that it's not. Um, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but it's it's not an, an absurd thesis. Um, Essentially, the uh, at the end of the day, what it's saying is that the next Novus Ordo conclave, if it elects an actual Catholic, a real Catholic, that man would be Pope. Okay, so it locates the the authority to designate a Pope in the false cardinals of the Novus Ordo Church. Okay, in a nutshell, and so. Uh, that is one, you know, uh, thesis that has been proposed, and it it uh, has been argued at, at great length and with with um, a lot of theological um, documentation behind it. So I just wanted to add, and actually on uh, on your Catholic Family podcast, you had His Excellency Bishop Donald Sanborn uh, explain it, right? He did exactly, and and very very graciously came on the show, so yes. came on this little podcast. I mean, and, and very nicely and simply stated the the thesis, which, as you say, is pretty hard to do. I and mean, I think you see the brilliance of his mind and being able mm -hmm. to simply explain something that is extraordinarily complicated. Yes, and and I I think that yeah, I mean, I think that it is good to have wise, intelligent men trying to figure this out. I mean, I think. In my opinion, either way, we're going to need we're going to need a miracle of some sort. If it's a great saint, or if it's it's Christ, or 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 something to to bring us to the next step. But I think that, as you say, I think you make such a good point that it's, we respect the papacy. We 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 we, we oh, honor absolutely. the papacy, and we say we cannot imagine Bergoglio or Ratzinger or JP two <clears throat> who have totally split everything that they teach, almost everything is contrary to 2,000 years of teachings of the Catholic Church. How can we possibly say just because of convenience, I, okay, I shouldn't say just convenience, but just because they, they have the, the, the they have the buildings, they are in Rome, they wear the right clothes and they say, I yeah. am the Pope. It doesn't, it, it, that's not that simple, right? I mean, you have to have the doctrine and the dogmas and they, they just don't. The papacy, if, if the papacy um, doesn't, have the divine assistance, then it's just another human institution. And that's exactly what we see in the Vatican today is uh, a pseudo papacy that obviously does not have divine assistance. I think that's pretty obvious. Right. And so what a lot of the semi trads do, like those apologists like uh, Peter Kwasniewski in particular, is they they try to squeeze Bergoglio into the papacy by by whittling down the papacy to the point of meaninglessness there are a lot of people who apparently think that uh there isn't anything more to the papacy than uh infallibility under very rare conditions and other than that it it, it is basically you know it can the pope can say and do whatever he wishes and uh there is no other assistance that is not the traditional teaching and honestly, if that were like if someone like Bergoglio were possible uh, as a pope, if um, you know the church could have, uh, if, if the papacy were as meaningless as he is, uh, as his so-called pontificate is, 
um, meaningless in terms of like the, the divine assistance is obviously not there. Well, then, you know, that would have happened early on. It wouldn't have taken 2,000 years for someone like Bergoglio to come around. So, um, yeah, so to those who are trying to save the papacy by acknowledging Bergoglio, like they think that unless we say he's the pope, and and his uh, whatever five predecessors are also popes because otherwise, then we don't know uh, how how to get a pope ever again. To those, I would simply say, if those men were popes, you don't need a papacy; it's useless. In fact, it's dangerous, right? Um, because the idea of the pope is that you can cling to him and safely follow him and know that you are actually clinging to the to the vicar of Christ and you are safely inside the mystical body that is the whole point of Christ establishing the papacy so it makes no sense to to adhere to a manifest apostate who promulgates heresy to the whole church and and leads souls to hell with his teachings uh it is like it it uh, it is pointless, it is dangerous, and it it doesn't save anything. So that's why, you know, we take the position, he cannot be the Pope, his five predecessors cannot have been Popes, and um, don't accuse me, don't accuse us of not having all the neat answers that we would like to have about, so now what, right? I mean, it's a legitimate question, um, but that doesn't negate all the evidence that they cannot have been popes and that if they had been popes then catholicism especially the papacy uh you know would basically be refuted because it, it, the papacy has no purpose apart from guiding souls uh, you know in the entire church to heaven with a divine assistance. So again, it is not a human institution, it's a divine institution. And yes, popes can be sinners, absolutely. And there have been great sinners who were popes. But the uh, we're not talking about, you know, so much the pope in his personal life, whether he be moral or immoral, we're talking about the, the papal magisterium and the papal, uh, you know, church governance. Um, so that with the divine assistance, the Pope cannot uh, lead souls into danger. Not everything he says and legislates is infallible or perfect, but everything is always at least safe to follow. And that is absolutely crucial. And people like Peter Kwasniewski either do know that or they could know it. They certainly should know it because that's what's in in the magisterium and that's what's in the theology books. And so my 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 challenge to anyone, friendly challenge. I don't even mean to be like, you know, um uh aggressive or anything. I'm just saying if you want to know for sure and if you want to maybe test yourself uh whether uh, whether you adhere to the papacy and whether Bergoglio can be pope, open these old texts uh, the, the old papal encyclicals that talk about the papacy, and wherever the word pope or Roman pontiff or Roman pontificate papacy, wherever these words appear, mentally substitute Bergoglio, Francis, John Paul II, whoever, right? Paul VI, Benedict XVI, and ask yourself, does that text still make sense? Do I believe that, right? And it, with Bergoglio, it's definitely, it, it's uh, absolutely clear. That there is no way, like one or the other has to go. Either Bergoglio goes or the papacy. So your choice is you either give up Bergoglio or you give up the Catholic faith. I, I guess right. I just don't understand the mindset. As you say, that, that is he the, as you say, you have to give up one or the other. I think you're, you're so right. And, and you just see, you see, they always look at us and say, okay, you guys have no path. You're, you're, you're confused. You're fighting. And it's like, yeah, that's kind of true. But, um, and yours is better. I mean, you're, you're writing a book about it and then going and shaking the hand of the person you just wrote the book about being part of the problem. It's just like, how is their site any better? I mean, it's much worse as you say, because you, you they, they call this man a Pope and he's, he's leading souls directly into hell and worshiping idols in St. Peter's. I mean, yes. I mean, to us, this is clear. And obviously to them, it's not. 
Well, you know, Father Father Chicana, God rest his soul, uh, called uh, the, the 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 Pope that the semi trads believe in is is a cardboard Pope, great for display purposes, but for display purposes only. And I think that's what we saw there with Taylor Marshall and the he needed to have the cardboard. He wanted to have the cardboard Pope, you know. Hey, look, buy my book or whatever. But um, yeah, theology is sorely lacking in these circles. And I know a lot of people turn to Peter Kwasniewski, who's who's now kind of made himself the kind of guru on this. But if you look at his argumentation, it is very poor. It is very poor. And I don't understand it because he's an academic. Okay. The man has a PhD in philosophy. Dr. Kwasniewski does. Um, but his theology and these, I mean, he's accusing us. He doesn't, he doesn't, you know, say, I don't think he really says who he's addressing, but it's pretty obvious. Well, oh, these people, they're, they're, they're relying on, you know, papal texts from 100 years ago. This man claims to be a traditionalist. Yeah. Or like overproof oh, texting or whatever. Well, excuse me, because we're traditional Catholics, we're using the traditional Catholic teaching. What else are we supposed to do? You know, and then he'll decry it as ultramontanism. Well, ultramontanism is a label for before Vatican I, excuse me, before Vatican I, there was a dispute on uh, papal authority between Gallicans on the one side and Ultramontanists on the other. And Vatican I sided with the Ultramontanists and, you know, said that that is the Orthodox Catholic position. So to call us Ultramontanists is a badge of honor. You know, and uh, it, it, it is amazing but uh, these these semi that's why we call them semi trads right and of course it is actually an improper term there is no such thing as just like as there there is not not half the catholic faith you know it, it, it's an improper name but i mean it's not meant to be a theologically accurate term it's meant to be a descriptive moniker that drives home the point that um we're dealing with people who are happy to be traditionalists but only up to a point right and so it is frightening to see how many people are willing to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, to essentially to tinker with the Catholic dogma and doctrine on the papacy just so they can continue to accept Francis as Pope. That, that is just, it is mind-blowing. Um, but it shows, again, that Bergoglio and the papacy don't go together. So you have a choice. You either have Bergoglio or you have the papacy. You can't have them both. You can't have Francis, like you can't have Pope Francis and the papacy. You have to make the papacy meaningless. You have to contradict the papacy. You have to deny the papacy to have your Pope Francis. In which case, I have to ask, what do you need him to be Pope for then? You just declared the papacy meaningless, right? So, uh, but I, I don't know what, the problem is, I, I, I guess, uh, either people don't really think about these things, or, and look, I understand that Sedevacantism is not an attractive position from a natural point of view. Um, you know, you, it's not convenient, uh, especially not as far as assisting at mass goes. Uh, it, there, there's a lot of things like you can't, there, there's a number of issues you can't really get resolved because the final authority is absent, the Pope, right? The ultimate authority that makes binding decisions for Catholics. So it's not, um, it's not a convenient position, but we're not called to follow whatever works best for us in our lives. We, you know, we're called to follow the truth. And so the only way you can make sense of the situation we've witnessed since the death of Pope Pius XII is to hold that the highest authority that gave us all this wickedness, all these errors, all these heresies, all these blasphemies, all these sacrileges, these invalid sacraments, the, the Novus Ordo Mass, that the authorities that gave us those were not the authorities of Christ, were not the Pope. And uh, that is the only thing that can explain why this was even possible to happen. Again, yes, that, that raises all sorts of other questions. Well, what happened? Well, 
you know, how, how is this going to be resolved? Now what do we do? Understood. But the fact remains that they are, they are not true popes, and uh, we have to deal with that. And nothing is saved if you claim that they are true popes and then refuse them submission because you can tell they're leading you away from Christ and from the mystical body. And so as a non-pope, um, I'm kind of going for another segue here. As a non-pope, can Bergoglio in any way affect a consecration of Russia or Ukraine or the world? Absolutely not. Effect? Absolutely not. Simply because he's not the pope, for one thing. And in addition to that, it's not like he's a Catholic who just happens not to be pope. This man is a blasphemer. He's an idolater. He's an apostate. He's a heretic. And uh, for that man to attempt to consecrate Russia and the Ukraine, and who knows what else he's going to consecrate in the end, um, you know, to the Immaculate Heart, it, I am concerned about heaven's response, if you know what I mean. And it's not going to be the conversion of Russia and a period of peace. If you... I don't you know, necessarily want to make that connection, but just in terms of historical sequence, when the Pachamama idolatry took place, it wasn't long after that we saw the whole uh, COVID stuff and you know, the, the, practically the whole planet on lockdown and all of the hardships that have resulted from that. I don't know if that is uh, you know, in any way connected. I'm not saying it is, but I also can't rule it out. And I think it is legitimate to at least suspect that it is related well and and we can say with certainty that the church tradition and teaching is that plagues and illnesses and famine and all these things do come from god's wrath right i, I mean i i think we can say that confidently and that's something again that we really forget in our modern times yeah, we just and, we, know, we really don't think about that anymore francis actually just contradict he disputed that very idea in his in last Sunday's Angelus, I think it was the Angelus on uh, March 20th. We should maybe clarify that this is being recorded on March 23rd. So two days before the actual consecration, we don't know yet what is going to happen. Um, but uh, yeah, so Francis has, ex and this wasn't the first time that he's done it. He explicitly says that God does not punish the world on account of sin. And uh, I forget the exact uh, um, uh, words he used, but that, that is the gist of it. On the other hand, he does say that, and, and I think, think he specifically said that regarding uh, COVID, that this is nature's response to the damage of the environment. So, see, he does believe that um, there is a certain connection with, you know, that's he does believe in cause and effect. But you can see, once again, the man is not a Catholic. Oh, God would never punish the world, but Mother Earth, yeah, well, we're not so sure about that. This is probably Mother Earth striking back. The guy has lost his marbles, not to mention his faith. Well, and keep in mind, too, that, that these idols, again, I think this is, teaching I mean, they're demons right I and mean, these are this is not just i think we can't underestimate what this means I, I mean this is not just a little piece of wood you know oh a little superstition a little witchcraft i mean this is demonic <laughs> it's straight from the devil so so yes. they brought devils into saint peter's in rome i, I mean of yes. course we're going to have some sort of of divine wrath i mean it just makes sense absolutely and, uh, you know, if you uh, think back to the uh, golden calf incident at the time of Moses, the wrath of God was terrible. And, um, you know, nowadays, Francis would probably say, oh, well, these are, you know, people expressing their different tra uh, religious traditions, right? And uh, we all uh, worship God in different ways or something like that. And no big deal. And... Um, whereas, you know, Moses wasn't exactly pleased when he saw that coming down from the mountain, <laughs> right? And, uh, that is the, the, the seriousness of such sins has been completely lost. Um, you know, 
it's it's absolutely scandalous it is extremely i mean idolatry worshiping the creature rather than the creator is one of the gravest sins you can commit and especially for someone who has or had the true faith like you know idolatry is bad enough when it's being committed by you know a, a pagan in the forest who's never you know never heard of the gospel but when those who are supposedly charged with preaching the gospel end up in idolatry let's see how much more grave that is you know when christ uh, was crucified he said father forgive them for they know not what they do the romans indeed did not know what they were doing but francis knows what he's doing right so he's he's moving toward a world in in which it appears to me based on what he's said what he's done what he's taught that he wants to move towards that uh masonic universal religion where everybody is basically at a fundamental level uh worshiping the same god and it's just these various religious cultural traditions that people still cling to but that have no like they're they're legitimate and have value insofar as they whatever express the uh, uh you know express the consciousness of man or something like that right or express a culture express a tradition uh, that is venerable and um but that has no claim to truth that is not connected ultimately with truth and um yeah so i think in the end that's what uh, what we're going to see and once that happens once the world believes that all religions are essentially the same they just do things differently they you know have their different beliefs about particulars but that are all kind of well how that's it's not all that important you know like we could this is this reconciled diversity we all acknowledge that we have different opinions essentially about these things but we can all still acknowledge that we're all believing in, in the same god and we're all you know um happily getting along in in human fraternity once that has been reach that's that state of humanity I, I don't see what would still uh why there would be any delay at that point for the antichrist to arrive right and then i mean we know it's going to happen i i'm not one of those end times prophets i don't care to be predicting the arrival of the antichrist or anything but it is part of divine revelation that he will come it will be one person one individual and he will reign over the entire globe and you always have to remember the antichrist will need to he doesn't need to deceive those that are knowingly evil that that mean to be evil and you know rejoice in that evil he has to deceive those who mean to be good and seek to do good and seek to love god those are the ones that he really has to deceive so we have to just be on our guard that whatever deception is going to come will be extremely great our lord said it in matthew 24 24 and uh, we have to pray that you know without without god's help you know we're all toast <laughs> that's for sure absolutely uh, so yeah. it's and, that, that and, 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 i think when we talk about fatima too i think that's so important to to remember that again this is all a sham because it, it can't work he's not a true pope the, the bishops at all it, it's not going to work it's probably as you say it could backfire i mean i talked to dr hoynovsky who's a fatima expert and he said it, he thinks kind of the same thing that it's a mockery of it but i think that for me it's, yes. it's important and i'm sure you would agree that our lady at fatima it wasn't that wasn't the only part of her message or afterwards to sister lucy too um it was also okay to the people repent and pray especially pray the rosary and 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 change yourselves and, and i think mm -hmm. again it's so easy for us to to point all to is is the pope ever going to do it if it's not bergoglio is it going to be the next true pope or i mean in the end the communism it, it all spread anyway so it was it was all done too late no matter what and and so hopefully i mean if it's eventually done i think i think the promise was that it would still change something and it, would, it would help to convert russia but i think in these 
visions to sister lucy i think i think that it was the, the case that um it was it was already too late anyway but but the, the the main thing is we've got to change our lives we have to repent and be good catholics especially for goodness sake if god is going to spend his wrath on the world which it so very well deserves boy we oh, better yeah. be ready for it and, and and i think that that doesn't mean to to sit in our in our homes and, and cry and, and and moan and complain it, it live happy good lives but but live saintly lives i suppose that that's the key yes and make reparation to the immaculate heart right make sacrifices that's very important and um yeah, who knows what, what is going to happen after that uh, supposed consecration, but it is very disheartening to see how many people are kind of unsure now. Ooh, Francis is doing the consecration of Russia, if that's even really what it is. I mean, he says the text we have now that's been released says uh, he's consecrating humanity, I think is what it says, especially Russia and the Ukraine. But let's be generous and say, okay, that does it. That's enough. That fulfills the conditions. Um, if you want to, if you if you are waiting to see what happens to decide whether he's the pope or not, you have not understood the papacy. You have not understood the Catholic principles that we have to go by. At the end of the day, you don't even have to believe in Fatima to be a Catholic, even to be a good Catholic. Although I think it would be foolish not to believe in Fatima, you know, because it evidently worthy of belief and the church has declared it worthy of belief um but this is not how we judge the validity of the claim of uh of somebody's claim to the papacy and we already know he's not the pope we don't need to wait for anything in fact i fear like people are asking to be deceived because they're going to be looking. See, I fear that most people are going to be just looking to, well, is the war going to end between Russia and Ukraine? And if it doesn't, like, oh, look, you know, miraculous. <laughs> that is not how miracles work, you know. There are plenty of natural ways, of non-miraculous ways, a war can end. And that's not, you know, Our Lady didn't say, oh, there's going to be a, a war with Russia, and, you know, once the consecration takes place, then that war will end. It, the, the, the consecration is chiefly about the conversion of Russia. Okay? A conversion to, to what? Well, obviously to Catholicism. What else would it be? Well, the and, the, the, the fake Sister Lucy, uh, according to Dr. Hoynovsky in, in, what was it? 1984 or 1993 I, I get the mm -hmm. dates wrong 84 i think yeah was it 84 and then she what was it she said that that it it worked or, or no that, that russia needed to be converted or, or was converted but not to the faith but to to um um a properly elected government or something it, it was purely <laughs> it was purely worldly it, it wasn't even faith -wise. i i'd have to look it up again I, I already forget even though we just did this podcast last week yeah but it it's it's again it's just kind of a farce it's just this idea of like wait why would our lady even care they don't care about democracy i mean communism and stuff okay i shouldn't say they don't care but i mean do you really think she would show up to sister lucy and just say yep russia needs to convert and, and become a democratic country i mean really yeah no it's, it's preposterous and then of course we still have the issue unresolved issue of the third secret which in my opinion just my opinion is no doubt about Vatican II and the entire Novus Ordo, all, this whole mess we've seen since the death of Pope Pius XII. Would that not make perfect sense, considering she said it should be revealed no later than 1960, because exactly. by then it would become clear, it would be understood, right? And by 1960, John XXIII had already announced the council. So if the Third Secret speaks about a wicked council, and that the church will bleed from all her wounds as one text that apparently appeared uh, in a mystical way, allegedly. We can't authenticate it, of course. That would make a lot of sense, right? Uh, and uh, I mean, I think we've lived, we've probably been living through the third secret. If you look at what the Catholic Church was when Pius XII was still reigning, and I mean, by no means was he perfect. You know, like sometimes, you know, people like to point out, oh, Pius XII did this wrong and that. Well, fine. He, he was not flawless. The Pope doesn't have to be flawless to be Pope. But just look at that huge 
beautiful bark of St. Peter with its commanding authority. I mean, the Catholic Church was a force to be reckoned with. Uh, it also, you know, in an like into, on an intellectual level. You know, even atheists, they, they, you know, even those that mocked the church, that hated the church, they knew um, that, like, they, they still had to, uh, how should I say, um, it was a real, like, they still respected the church at some level. Because the Catholic Church could answer those fools. And I say fools because the Bible says that, you know, the, the, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. All right. So um, even non-believers had respect for the Catholic Church, and they knew that her claims, obviously, I mean, if they're non-believers, they didn't believe them, but they still, they, they were, they, you couldn't just dismiss them, right? And if you look at that majestic Catholic Church, especially here in the United States under Pope Pius XII, I mean, you have to remember people were watching Archbishop Fulton Sheen in the evenings, right, whenever his program was on in the 1950s and I think the 40s as well, and you had, you know, those those radio priests in the United States and Australia, you had uh, the great father Charles Coughlin. Uh, I think at some point a third of the entire nation of, of the United States listened to, father, to a Catholic preacher in the 1930s or 40s. That is... I mean, can you imagine that today? I mean, look at the people that they have nowadays. Antonio Spadaro, right? Reinhard Marx, um, Blaise Supich, John Stowe in Kentucky. Who are these people? You know, and they think themselves so extremely, you know, academic and intellectual, and their, their theology is a nightmare. And nobody can take them seriously. And nobody does take them seriously. And, you know, I mean, they, they might perhaps, um, I mean, at this point, there's still the certain, I guess, aura of respect uh, that, that some, some, some people have for people like Francis or whatever, you know, because, oh, well, look, there's the Pope and all that. Uh, but, you know, then the guy uh, talks about the revolution of tenderness. I mean, it's just a joke. Nobody can take this seriously. Um, and so what what a contrast between the Catholic Church in 19, just to pick whatever, 1957, and what call what calls itself the Catholic Church today. It is a sort of what has happened is a sort of anti-miracle. It is like it, it is like miraculous in a in a in an inverted way. You went from how how could an institution um, go from so majestic and respected to such a laughing stock in a matter of decades? Well, it, there's obviously something diabolical going on, and um, you know I don't know how it's going to. Uh, well, we all know how it's all going to end eventually, but uh, I don't, uh, I have no idea how this is going to go on now. You know, um, obviously we're going to be looking at a papal con supposed conclave uh, in uh, not too long of a time. I mean, Francis is, I think, 85 and um, Benedict the 16th is almost 95. Um, so we're probably going to be, be seeing the death of Benedict pretty soon and the death of Francis fairly soon. And uh, who knows what's going to happen then? I mean, I, I'm not super optimistic, I suppose. But but again, I, who knows? I mean, only God knows. And, and I think that, that that's, again, in the end, my goal here on this podcast is to, yeah, to spread good culture. Because, because I think what can we affect... We, we can't affect the movings of cardinals it's through our prayers of course and, and and sacrifice i mean we can but but i mean we can affect our, our own lives our own circles our own the people we come in contact with and and i know i mean with you you know nova sort watch has had such a huge impact i mean i know i've watched interviews with priests who said that were in the nova Sordo who who it eventually became you know uh state of a oh, and God bless them. yeah yeah and they, they were you know 
influenced by by Novus Ordo Watch. And I think that's that's an amazing thing that you don't know what what you can do, what you can write, what you can put time into that will have effect on somebody else. And some some people more than others, and everyone has their own mm -hmm. skills. But I think that's really important that that we do the best that we can to yeah live our faith and and spread our faith as yeah. long as we can because who knows who, who knows before before the internet shut off I, we don't know what's going to happen i mean nuclear war i mean i think we still live comfortable lives you and i are having a podcast from across an ocean you know i mean we we still right. live well but i think that we need to prepare ourselves mentally and especially spiritually for what might come whatever that is and i think we both would probably agree that at some point, it's not going to be pretty. Right. And, you know, no matter what happens after Francis dies, eventually the Novus Ordo Church will collapse under its own irrelevance. And I, I think that that's definitely on the horizon. So, and then, you know, who knows? But it has to, right? As you said so well before, I mean, when, when you are a, 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 a religion that, that doesn't actually believe in a religion you know you just if you say it's all good how can you possibly that th there is no way to stand on it i mean you you have to collapse because you don't believe in anything right yes yes and you know that document on human fraternity where francis says that god wills a diversity of religions that's now that's been published in the acts of the apostolic see so this is official teaching from francis that is not just something like, you know, a plain interview. We can just say, ah, he was just talking off the cuff or whatever. Um, this is serious business. And we know that God will not be mocked. So, um, you know, I don't know. After Francis, is it just going to be yet another Novus Ordo Antipope? Um I have no idea. I I really don't see this going on for much longer. But then I never thought we'd see twenty twenty two either. So I'm that not good at predicting thing, the future. Right? Who who can know? And I, and I guess all we can do is pray and and suffer. And, and and actually, I do want to plug something that we're doing here. We we have a pilgrimage planned in August. Mm -hmm. You'd be right. very welcome to come, Mario. Come back to your homeland. Um, come and do a pilgrimage with us, and uh, it's 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 a two day walk to the shrine of Alt Utting, which is a Marian shrine just east of Munich. Uh, that'll be in the first week of August on a Thursday and Friday. Um, anyone who's interested, send me an email at kevin eighty nine davis at gmail dot com. the The intentions are primarily, yeah, I, I guess church unity and and yeah, the the troubles of the world. That there's, I guess, there's not an extremely direct intention. We we want a lot of people to have their own intentions and kind of yeah to suffer a little bit and, and do this pilgrimage which is i think it was 60 kilometers ends up being 35 miles or something like that i think so it's it's enough to hurt your feet it's not quite as long as chartres or um paris but it's 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 a very nice experience for anyone who has never done a pilgrimage it's worth doing it it's absolutely incredible it is it's something that i truly believe will change your life if you do it with right intentions mm -hmm. and i think that if there's anything that's going to save our world it's prayer and suffering and you can combine them both in two days. <laughs> yeah. And then we do at the end, we have a nice music fest where we can we can eat schnitzel and drink beer and, and play Ooh. music with a bunch of Catholics. So it's a really fun weekend, first week yes. of August. Um, so anyone who's interested, hit me up. But I think Mario, I think I think I, I mean I, I had a fantastic time, a great chat. I really appreciated you coming on. I'd love to Absolutely. plug you. I, I, everyone probably knows you anyway. It's novasordowatch.com.org.com. Either way, but the, the proper Either domain way. is .org. NovelSortoWatch.org. Okay. Tradcast.org takes you straight to the podcast. And, uh, yep, there's going to be a lot more content coming. Uh, certainly, there's enough going on that merits comment. No doubt. And, and you're on social media, you're on Facebook and Twitter. You always have a lot of good sources. A lot of those links you're talking about, these news links of just kind of you do you do the work that no one else wants to do. You got to dig through all this garbage <laughs> and kind of share it. I mean, poor you. So so anyone out there, please please appreciate the time that he gives it and, and do support Mario. I mean I mean spending he spends his time doing this to give us this information and to yeah try to help bring souls to God and try to make bring some clarity to the situation, which is so vitally important. And as you said, as Mario said, I guess now speaking in third person, and, and to to you know try to be a voice out there where we badly need a voice in, in this in this world where 
yeah, there are a lot, there's a lot of confusion. And I think I, I appreciate that. I know many people do. You can support this channel on Patreon. I'll attach that link as well. Like, share, and subscribe. That's the most important thing you can do. I, I'm not making any money off of this, um, but we just want to try to, yeah, do the best we can to further the greater glory of God. So Mario, I, I'd ask hey, you man. if you have any last words and then, and, and then I'm going to, I'm going to already set an appointment for when I can have you on again sometime. <laughs> but, <laughs> sure. But please, well, last words me, before we go. Let me thank you for the great work you're doing with your podcast. You know, I think a lot of people you know, may not realize that there is something they can do if, um, then you know, with whatever resources, skills, whatever they have, there's a lot that can be done for the cause. I try to do my um, my part with Novel Sword of Watch, you know, educating people about the differences between real Catholicism and this counterfeit Catholicism of the Vatican II religion. And uh, I want to thank all supporters, those who support financially, those who support spiritually, uh, volunteers who help. They're all appreciated. And uh, so I'm very grateful, of course, to Almighty God and the Blessed Mother and the saints. So thank you very much for having me on, Kevin. It was a pleasure. For you as well and um again for the for the world premiere <laughs> thanks for coming on the world premiere and, and until next time god bless okay god bless